Today on Crazy Performance Repair, we are going to take this engine, flip it upside down, and get to working on it. Get this crankshaft out of here. We have to figure out what bearings we're going to need, if any at all. I don't know if this crank that I have sitting here is going to fit these bearings or not, but there are three different bearing types depending on the crank specific grind. So we are going to find that out. So stay tuned and uh, enjoy the video. motor upside down and the moment I flipped this thing over it was like that it's obvious I'm gonna have to pull this timing cover this is the oil pump this oil pump is insanely thick I don't know why it is so huge but uh, we're probably about to find out I'd imagine now I do see a solenoid here so this solenoid has to be to control oil pressure I would imagine they must have that integrated into here for fuel economy, I, I, I would guess. My bet is that this guy drops the oil pressure via pulse width control to lower the oil pressure to a safe operating mode, but to reduce as much resistance from the pump as possible to help with fuel economy. So this is gonna be one of the main reasons this motor is more efficient than other motors. I've always wondered why they wouldn't do something like that. Well, now they've done it. Good for Ford, however, if that thing were to fail, I can't imagine there'd be anything good from that thing failing, so <laughs> I guess I have a little bit of a mixed feeling about that. I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing off. This is gonna require a special puller. That looks just like this guy here. It comes with different length deals. This guy, obviously, to go in there, and then it's gonna have this is an optional feature. I happen to buy the ones with these little pieces. These help keep it in place. Now, this puller design was originally designed mostly for Chrysler vehicles, and it seems that all the manufacturers now are really starting to integrate this style of puller for the balancer versus the bolted style. Um, this one's got these spots for hooking these very heavy duty hooks onto. So, I'll go ahead and throw a link in the description for one of these, and uh, Let's go ahead and get this thing out. All right, I know, I know it's not for impact use, I get it, but I don't got time for farting around. Now, for those of you who are like myself and really don't care about not for impact use, we just buy another one. Um, if you want to prevent from damaging the threads, a very good product to use on the threads is ARP Bolt Thread Lube. So, if you have some ARP lube, that is a very good solution to use for keeping those threads protected. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started zipping all these bolts off of here. Uh, we'll just fast forward through all that stuff. And I do have to take a couple of bolts off of the valve cover as well, but I'm hoping I don't have to take the whole valve cover off. At least I don't think so. The big challenge here is gonna be dealing with the timing chain when it comes down to that because I'm in hopes that I can leave everything intact, maybe take the tensioner, lock it in place, find a way to hold the, the timing chain in a position that I can still slide the, the crank out. But I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that considering where the oil pump is. I might have to go into big, deep dive into this motor. Um, but let's hope I can avoid doing that. It's gonna be interesting, but we'll get it done. All right, so we are down to the timing chain now, and uh, you can see there is a lot of chain going on here. Now, Ford has a problem with their timing chains. On these motors, typically they go out between 80 and 120,000 miles, uh, so be expecting to have to do these around that mileage if you have one of these vehicles. I'm actually going to take a look at this one here. Uh, it was a part, so I'd imagine they replaced these timing components but I'm kind of like taking a quick look here, just in case, and uh, we're gonna see if there's anything that I notice. Otherwise, I gotta get the timing set to top dead center, so I'm gonna look at wherever top dead center number one is. Once I do that, I'm gonna have to remove the timing components, and I'll have to remove everything except for obviously these pulleys, and then the chains I will leave in place as far as on the pulley itself, because I'm not gonna pull it around the valve cover here, but if I get everything so that it's in place where it can't move, I'll wedge something in this part here, then I should be able to go ahead and 
get the oil pump off of here, then I can finally pull the crank out. So it's a little bit of a task, but it's not impossible. All right, I'm gonna get the bolt back in here and start turning this thing over so we can see where we're at. Okay, so as I was turning the motor over on this thing to get to top dead center, I was just watching the piston to know, you know, number one top dead center. And uh, once I got it there, I quickly realized that the uh, timing marks on this particular motor are chain specific marks. Now, if I were to do this per the book, I would have to take the valve covers off and then the, the little indicators are gonna be somewhere on the top here. I saw them on the phasers, but they were, now they're on the top somewhere and they line up with a link. So there's gonna be a mark on every, on, on the links in coordination with timing. Now, a little shortcut that I have learned for this is if, if you know the motor timing is good and you're not planning on replacing parts. Now this one, I'm not sure if I'm gonna replace parts or not, but I'm going to mark them just in case I don't replace parts. Um, if you're not sure, you can mark the things, create your own marks. And all I'm gonna do is I can see where the link would go right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark this spot. Now it's actually landing between two links here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put two marks to make it line up with that little dot there. It, this is a super scraper, so it's got a carbide bit so it can leave a little scratch in things. And that's all I'm doing, I'm just leaving a little scratch. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark everything with a little mark, except for the rear chain back here because I'll pull the front chain off first before I mark that. Now, if you saw what I just did a little bit ago in fast forward, holding the, the cam position into, into a certain position, and I did that by taking a couple bolts and wedging a bolt between the pulleys here, tightening it down enough so that it, it will hold it in position so that, that no matter what, these things won't be able to just flop any direction. So that should hold it in, no problem. Um, and with that, I should be able to not have to pull the valve covers and still be able to pull the crank out. And that's my goal, is to save a little bit of time with the valve covers, because there's a bunch of crap I have to pull off to get those valve covers off. So hopefully I don't have to replace these chains, guides, and all that jazz, and I can get away with doing what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna go ahead, pull this tensioner. This thing will come out, but there's a little deal that I can do to unratchet it, and I'll show you how to do that once I get to that point. So for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and zip the bolts out of here. Hopefully it doesn't come apart. Some of them will. Nope, this one does not come apart. So you can see how far it went out. That tells me that there is a lot of room in this chain yet. Ooh, it just jumped. I did not want that. But you know what, I have it marked so I'm okay. I can get it back in that position. That means that it did move a little bit. Oh, but it just went that way, okay. Yeah, that'll be fine. So now I can slide this guy out of here and take a look at this guide. This guide is brand new, so they did replace everything then. So that's good, that's really good. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save the parts for the obvious reason of why replace them. Ooh, I did not like that. See that? How it flexes? Hopefully it's just flexing and it's not broken. Ooh, they over tighten that bad. That should not take that much torque. I'm gonna grab a ratchet. Wow. I don't think they know what torque wrenches are. Whoever did this. Oh, holy crap. All right, I'm gonna try these ones too. Oh, this, this one's okay. Oh, that one's okay. It looks like uh, they just didn't torque the two of them. They just reefed the crap out of them. I don't know how they were even so tight. Those were way too tight though. Like I said, hopefully it didn't crack the plastic. All right, I'm gonna let this guy jump over so that I can get this thing out. It's got a groove in there that's not letting it go by. There we go. Okay, now that the chain has jumped on that pulley too, we're gonna go ahead and not worry about 
the chain very much. We're just going to drop it down in here and let it let it stuff itself in here. And I'm actually going to go ahead and line up this mark just so I have one of the marks lined up. Now we need to get this guy marked and then pull that out. Okay, so this uh, timing gear is one gear. So I'm just going to go ahead and mark the chain here the same as I did the chain on the other side and it'll just correlate with the other marks. So now I can zip this guy out. Now you want to be sure to use a impact to take this bolt out because whatever you do you do not want the pistons being turned by the crank movement like with a ratchet down into the cylinder head area because what will happen is you'll end up impacting one of the valves and bending a valve. So what I'm going to do when I take this crank out of here is I'm actually going to take the rod bolts off or rod caps off and I'm going to push them down real nice and gently until it touches something and then I know it's either hitting a valve or bottoming out and I will stop there and if it feels like it's not quite down as far as the rest of them want I will pull it up a little bit so I know it's not on the valve that way when I go to set the crank back down in there I won't bump it and smack the valve so that's kind of a little safety precaution I'm going to do. I'm also going to leave the spark plugs in that way when it does does go down it creates a little resistance on the ones that the valves are closed and I'll know that the valves are closed because I'll have a resistance to it. All right so the front half of this block has a whole lot of nothing in it except for timing and oil pump. That oil pump is insanely big by the way um, as far as the housing goes but it's really not as big as it looks from the bottom. So you can see the crank here, the bearing, the cap, the block. We're going to go ahead and get this all apart. Now these do have side bolts going into these so we're going to have to take those out first and looks like the motor mounts might be in the way. You guys can't see that but it does look like it's in the way so let's get you guys on a top side view. Look at what we're dealing with. Okay so we're looking at this end here. I just happened to notice this. Here are the oil drain tubes for the turbos. They come in right here. Just a little note I guess. This motor mount does not look like is not in the way of those bolts. This oil housing is, however, from a straight shot perspective, but I might be able to take this bolt out without doing the oil housing. Depends on how long it is. Uh, the rest of them look good on this side. This one looks like there's only one, unless this thing's a short enough bolt, it looks like there's only one that's in the way of this motor mount, which means the motor mount has to come off. That's kind of dumb. And then the rest of them are nice and clear. So I'm gonna start taking all the bolts out and then uh, you guys can watch as I deal with all the connecting rods. Now I am going to mark these connecting rods with the same thing as before. I need the caps marked per cylinder because the caps are going to be rod specific. They will not work with another rod. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And in order to do this, I have to start with the connecting rods accessible to me because I don't want to be turning this motor over any more than I have to. Um, so any of them that are accessible I will do. The ones that are not accessible I will try and turn the crank in a fashion that pulls it away from the top of the cylinder before I let it go towards the top of the cylinder. Okay this is one that is definitely on the compression stroke because the moment I tapped the bolt to push down on the rod and disconnect the rod cap it came right back at me. I felt like a spring tension so there's air pressure in there. All right, we're about to pull this two-piece crankshaft out of here. So I figured I'll get you guys slowed down to real time because this is going to be interesting when this thing comes apart. Are you guys as ready as I am to see this thing? I know I'm kind of excited to see how it comes out. Oh, I better evaluate this. I don't want to drop it and dunk it back in there and damage something. All right, where is the brake? Brake is right there. So this piece should come out first. Yep, there it is. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, that is, <laughs> that is awfully broken. We'll put it that way. Holy craps. Wow. Okay, that is, uh, that's interesting to say the least. Now I am noticing there is no oil hole, so the oil hole for this rod journal goes this direction into this main, so that one must go that direction into this main. I was expecting that there might be a rod, a rod journal bearing or hole going through here, and that's why it broke because it's got a weak spot. But it's not the case, so that's a little bit interesting. It must have just been a factory flaw. 
All right, I'm gonna set this down and then we'll get the other piece out. All right, cool. That's, that's something else. That's a first for me. All right, especially since it ran. So what I need to do is I need to get some numbers off of this crank. Hypothetically, there's a number in the back here that is supposed to give me the identity of what bearings I'm supposed to run. So I'm guessing it's this little tag back here. Not totally positive, but that's my guess because I don't see anything else in here for a number. Now, oh, there are some numbers on the bearings. That's interesting. Okay, so we got, we got a number two on the bearing. Why is there a picture of what looks like a phone? You guys can't see that obviously, but notice something. We have red bearings on here. So this is something kind of cool. They actually have coated bearings, half coated bearings. So the other half of the rods, those bearings are not coated. That half is coated. Now, why would you, why would you want to do that? What is the purpose of doing that? So coated bearings are rather expensive. Uh, as far as a manufacturer sees it because any penny they can save is a win. This motor makes a lot of torque. Torque is the destroyer of things. So bearings being coated here is a protection for if it does lack oiling at any point, it will add an extra layer of protection against the bearing. Now when it comes to race car applications, the bearings are coated and that's for the same reason to help protect the bearing, make it last longer. Um, so you can see we have all the tops of the rods coated. That's because that's where all the load goes. The bottom end of the rod does not get any kind of load. There's no real reason to coat that unless it's a high RPM load you're trying to protect because then it has to pull the piston down really quick. Also the piston accelerating upward before it turns around and comes back down puts a lot of stress on it. So that is why they have only half coated. Save money and only do it on the loaded side where it really, really needs it. Um, and then why are these not coated then? So most of the, the torque is on the other side. Most of the pressure is on the other side of the bearing. So the cap side. So let's take a look at a cap once. You can see it's coated. Now this one has a little wear. That is the rear one, the one for this. So I'd imagine that's because that was broken and moving around a little bit. So I may have to replace that one even if it is the right size. Um, and then this one was the one right here. So also probably have to replace that because it's got a little coating wear going on. And then this is the front one. It's coated on both top and bottom. The one behind it is only coated on the bottom. Now why would they leave these three uncoated but coat the rest? Well again, price. But why coat this one, right? So the only reason I could expect they coat this one is because of the tensioner and the chains pulling up on that thing. So at low load conditions, this thing's going to be being pulled up against. And so this bearing will see a little bit of extra stress on it. Whereas these all will no matter what see stress in the down position. They'll never see stress pushing up against it because this is pulling this way. So it automatically pulls the crank this direction. So by doing that, all the caps get the load not this. That's why they didn't coat these three. But this does get load, however, because it gets pulled down by the chain. Now when the motor is under full load, heavy load, acceleration, what, what have you, then this is not needed to be extra protection, but they do it for the chain, obviously. But this actually would have no load. It would be pushing against just down here. It always pushes down because the pistons are pushing down. So just a little 101 on why they would do some weird bearing coating like that. This is crazy though. So we're bringing this video to a very quick end because that was going to go on for way too long. So on the next video we are going to be talking about bearings, timing components, and we are going to make sure that we get it ready to go in the vehicle. So be sure to hit the notification bell so you are notified when that comes out and I will hopefully see you on the next video. Thanks for joining me on this one and hopefully you enjoyed it.